Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Torah View of the Hot Topics. Tonight, we're going to discuss espionage in Halakha. What does the Torah say about spying? Is spying permissible? Of course, spying is in the news because Jonathan Pollard has finally made Aliyah after decades languishing in prison for having passed on intelligence from the U.S. Navy to Israel and then being held under house arrest and not being allowed to leave the country, he has finally been allowed to fulfill his lifelong dream, or at least his dream that he had all the way through prison, to be in Israel. Now, many years ago, I visited Jonathan Pollard in prison. In 2007, I heeded the call. A call went out to rabbis to see who would be able to accompany uh, an engineer from their community on a clergy mission to Jonathan Pollard. Now, here was the thing. Jonathan Pollard, very intelligent man. Don't have to say he was working for uh, naval intelligence. He had an idea. And yet he couldn't bring his idea to fruition. He needed someone to take the idea that he could simply communicate verbally. He couldn't write anything down. Communicate verbally, take this idea out beyond the prison walls and develop it. Now, I have to tell you, due to the proprietary nature of the idea, I cannot disclose exactly what it was. But in 2007, I went along with a member of my community uh, and we visited Jonathan Pollard at the invitation of Rabbi Pesach Lerner. At the time, he was the head of National Council of Young Israel. Now, we enter, we met with Jonathan. Now, Jonathan had not been a well man at the time. He had really undergone a lot of uh, anguish and suffering many times in solitary confinement. There were times that we didn't even know where he was or what his situation was. So at the time that we visited him, he was quite poorly. His health was not great. And he communicated this idea. We took this idea. And I have to tell you, some ideas, although it was 2007, Jonathan Pollard was way ahead of the curve. Now understand, this is a man that did not have access to the internet. He knew about the internet, but he'd never used the internet. In 2007, internet's been around, we've all been using it since the 90s, he had not used the internet. And yet simply by reading books in the prison library, he had kept up to date, he was thinking, he had, an amazing plan that he had come up with in his mind that he then communicated and was then passed on to uh, companies outside. Now, obviously, the issue with any brilliant idea is that it takes funding. One needs to have not just the good idea, but one needs to have a backer who is willing to invest in that idea. So it is an ongoing idea. It is something that Jonathan continues to work on. And I tell you, viewers, stay tuned. Jonathan Pollard's next greatest thing is yet to come. So let's talk about spying and espionage in Halakha. Question is, how undercover may one go in the service of one's country? Let's start with uh, one of our most famous, acclaimed spies, a hero to all, Ellie Cohen, made famous once again uh, recently by the acting uh, of Sasha Baron Cohen, a homegrown boy from Hampstead Garden suburb. Ellie Cohen. Yeah, I like to tell the story. When I was a teenager, I was once in a trivia uh, test, uh, trivia competition. And I was asked the question, how did Ellie Cohen die? Now, I knew that one. That was very easy for me. I knew my Tanakh. I knew my Bible. I said, well, Ellie Cohen, he fell off his chair when he heard the terrible news of, about his sons. Of course, I thought that they were talking about Ailey Cohen Godel, Ailey, the high priest, 
the mentor of the prophet Samuel. Uh, sometime later, as I grew and matured, I learned the story of the contemporary hero, Ellie Cohen, who sacrificed his life for the safety and security of the state of Israel, the Jewish people. He disguised himself as a Syrian Muslim to live in Syria and be the third in command in Syria. Now, we know that the way that he uh, showed Israel where the Syrian troops were was that he had them plant trees in order to be shaded. But at that point, Israel knew exactly where the troops were hidden. Now, in order for Eli Cohen to maintain his cover, there were many things that he had to do that ordinarily, according to Jewish law would not be permissible. I'm not sure how religious he was or wasn't, but had he been a religious observant Jew, would he be allowed to masquerade as a Muslim, go to the mosque, pray, bow down to Allah? Are, are these things permissible? Are other situations, are you allowed to, obviously it's not applicable to the Eli Cohen case, but intermarry, uh, eat pork, what do you do? How far undercover can you go for the sake of espionage? What is permissible according to Jewish law? Now, the Torah says in Parshat Acharemot, Ushmar temet chukotai vet mishpatai, and you shall keep my laws and my statues, asher yase otam ha'adam v'chai bahem, ani Hashem, that a person should do and live by them. I am God. That's what the Pasuk says. Our sages tell us, from here we derive, it's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, page 74a, from here we derive that we are entailed to keep the mitzvot and live by them. In other words, if it were a matter of physical endangerment, if it were a matter of life and death, then we would override the mitzvot. We would be allowed to eat that pork if somebody held a gun to my head because I have to be able to live. But the Gemara gives us three exceptions. There are three cardinal sins that may not be transgressed even under the threat of death. What are they? Murder, idolatry, and licentiousness. If somebody holds a gun to my head and says, kill that person or I will kill you, you have to take the bullet. If somebody holds a gun to your head and says, worship, bow down to those idols or I will kill you, you have to take the bullet. If somebody says, act immorally, promiscuously, licentiously, in terms of sexual sin, you have to rather take the bullet than act immorally. So those are the three cardinal sins. So it would seem that, that there are certain things, certain red lines that we can't cross over. So how about armies? Armies kill people. So listen to this verse in the Torah. The Torah says a special law. It's not true as per English law, but as far as the Torah is concerned, if, a, if you hear your house is being burgled and there's an intruder and you jump out and you attack the intruder and you kill them, probably not your intention, you are absolved of punishment. Why? Because it's considered self-defense. What's the self-defense? Well, the assumption is that if a burglar were caught, they would take all measures necessary to protect themselves, even if it meant um, murdering, killing. And so you, by stopping them in their tracks, you have acted out of self-defense. And from here, we derive that in a case of self-defense, that's not considered murder. If you've killed someone who was going to or might have killed you, you thought that they might have killed you, you are not liable. So that's firstly, the first exception when it comes to killing, you may kill in order to save your own life from the person that's pursuing you. So that's how an army can kill because our, they want to kill us. So we kill in order to protect our own lives from them. 
So that's exception number one. What about the other two? So let me tell you, the second case uh, is a case that does come up uh, in the case of espionage. Promiscuous behavior, probably most famous is the honey trap. Our most famous uh, historic or uh, well, contemporary uh, honey trap is the story of Mordechai Venunu. Venunu worked in Dimona, it would seem, uh, in a factory that may or may not have uh, engaged in military uh, activity, activity that Israel wanted to keep secret from the world. Mordechai Venunu decided that he was going to sell that story to the Sunday Times. In order to stop Mordechai Venunu in his tracks, the Mossad set up a honey trap. A honey trap works whereby someone comes and seduces another individual. That way they can trap them. So along goes Cindy. Cindy, whose uh, real name uh, is, was Bentov, uh, she goes and introduces herself to Venunu in London and entices Venunu to Rome, where he is taken by the Mossad back to Israel and tried and given an 18-year sentence for espionage. Now, presumably, there was some kind of relationship that took place that would be considered an adulterous relationship. Uh, Cheryl Bentov was married at the time to her husband living in Israel. I think nowadays they live in Florida. And she engaged in a relationship that was outside of her marriage. Was she allowed to do that? So we have a couple of examples in the Torah, in the Tanakh, of uh, people that engaged in promiscuous behavior. And it seems to be that they are extolled by our tradition. The first one is Yael. During the siege of the uh, armies of Sisera, we had the head of the Jewish people, the head of the uh, nation of Israel, was Deborah, the prophetess. Now, they had vanquished Sisera's armies, and Sisera was running away and wanted to seek refuge. He saw the tent of Yael and Hever, who were Canaanites, who were close to the Hebrew people, to the Israelite people, and he says, can I hide here? Yael says, please do, come in. She then seduces him, and she kills him. That is the end of the war. That is the salvation of our people. And she is extolled in the Song of Deborah as the most blessed of women. Now, the Talmud tells us uh, in Nazir 23b that she is called the most blessed of women in spite of her licentiousness, in spite of her promiscuous behavior. That's why the Tanakh has to call her the most blessed of women, to show that she didn't sin. What might appear to be a sin was something that was done for the good of the people, and she acted properly. Now, the Talmud also talks about in Megillah 15a, about Esther, Esther, who was married to Mordechai, is the implication of the Talmud there, and she subjected herself, submitted herself to Ahasuerus, to Ahasuerus. And did she act properly? Did she act improperly? Now, there's a suggestion that in the beginning, she really didn't have a choice. Ahasuerus called upon all the maidens of the land, and he chose her. She probably didn't get to choose whether or not to be part of Akashve Rosh's harem. The thing is, though, the Talmud says that later when she chooses, in order to save the people, to enter the inner chamber of Akashve Rosh, at that point, it was on her own volition. And if it was by her own volition, then it was her choice. 
to submit herself sexually to Ahasuerus. So if she did that, she apparently transgressed one of those three cardinal sins in order to, uh, and which we know uh, one, one cannot transgress even at the threat of death. So Rabbi Yecheskel Landau, uh, in the Note of Yehuda in the 18th century, he similarly lords Esther uh, the same way that Yael is lauded for her courage and self-sacrifice and says that she did the right thing. But why? He gives a caveat. He says, in the case of uh, Yael, or in the case of Esther, she, they acted on behalf of the entire Jewish people. If it was simply a matter of someone holding a gun to Esther's head and saying, act like this, she would not be allowed to do so. But since she was acting on behalf of all of the Jewish people, all of our lives, mehodu ve'ad kush, the entire world is what Ahasuerus ruled over. Since all of our lives were at stake, so that is an, an exception to the three cardinal sin rule, and one may transgress even the three cardinal sins in such an instance. Now, so we've spoken about killing. We've spoken about licentiousness. How about idolatry? Is idolatry ever permissible? Firstly, what we need to know is it's not so simple that Ellie Cohen, pretending to be a Muslim, was therefore guilty of idolatry. Islam is not necessarily idolatry. There's a famous response of the Rambam, Maimonides, suggesting that Islam is an exception, that if they do hold a gun to your head and say, be an adherent of Allah, go to the mosque, it may be permissible because, after all, Islam believes in radical monotheism, only one God, and it's the same God that we are worshipping, and therefore, maybe it would be permissible, and on the contrary, maybe one should rather become a Muslim than take that bullet. But if it weren't Islam, or if it were clear out and out idolatry, would there be any exceptions to our three cardinal sin rule? So the Talmud and Sanhedrin tells the story of King David. King David didn't have an easy life. Uh, at one point, he was pursued by his predecessor, King Saul. Later in life, he was pursued by his rebellious son, Absalom, Avshalom. Avshalom wanted to kill his father, and King David was running away, and he stops at a hill. And at this hill, he contemplates idolatry. And his advisors say to him, what are you doing? You can't, you, you're, you're the righteous King David. You can't worship idols. And David says, well, listen, here's my concern. My concern is that Avshalom will kill me. And then what will the people say? They will say there is no justice. There is no value in pursuing righteousness. Look at David, the righteous king, who met such a fate. After David was killed, we have no hope. But if I were known as an idolater, if I publicly worship idols, then people will say, oh, David wasn't righteous. There was a reason that David was killed. It was because he wasn't the righteous king that we thought he was. He was an idolater, and that's why God allowed him to be killed. So David says, on account of the potential chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name, I would rather sacrifice, compromise my own religiosity and worship these idols rather than people giving up their own religiosity, rather than en masse there be this spiritual death of the people who say that there is no God, or God's not in control, or Judaism, Torah and mitzvot don't work, they don't help. If even King David could be killed, then it's not worth it. So here we find a strange exception 
Normally, Chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name, actually works in an inverse way. What do I mean? So we said that if somebody holds a gun to your head, you rather take the bullet than, uh, tra than transgress. Uh, sorry, you rather transgress than take the bullet for most of the mitzvot. So if someone says, eat pork or I kill you, you eat the pork. The exception to that is Chilul Hashem. What's Chilul Hashem? Desecration, public desecration of God's name. If the those who want to destroy us are saying that we are going to make a public spectacle of you eating pork, then you rather take the bullet than, than eat the pork. Let people not say that Rabbi Frieden couldn't hold up against the bullet. He gave in to the pork. No, in that case, it would be a chilul Hashem, it would be a public desecration of God's name, and one would be required to take the bullet rather than eat the pork. But in this case, we have the inverse of that relationship, where King David says it's, it would be a potential chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name, if I were to be killed by Absalom, and so therefore I am going to rather be an idolater, be known as an idolater, rather than everybody give up en masse uh, of God and Torah and mitzvot. So we see that there are exceptions. Generally, we say v'chai bahem, that one should live by the mitzvahs, not die by the mitzvahs. The three exceptions we generally say are murder, immorality, and idolatry. But even those have exceptions for in certain instances. So what is the general rule? So Rabbi Shlomo Goran, former Israeli chief rabbi, looks at all of these cases and he says the general rule of the that overrides even the three cardinal sins is the case of national endangerment. If there is a risk of national lives, then even these three cardinal sins we override. So again, in the case of killing, so if our army needs to go out to protect the people, then they are allowed to kill because it's protecting the whole nation. In the case of uh, uh, sexual licentiousness, so we saw from Yael, we saw from Esther, and it would be the same uh, in the case of Cindy and the Venunu case, that for the purposes of national security and protecting the lives of the nation, one would be allowed to transgress even that sin. And so when the entire nation is at risk, even the great three sins, we override for the sake of the greater good. So this ruling has wide ranging implications not least of which is the permissibility or indeed obligation of a nation to have an army, including a strong intelligence with proper espionage for the safety and security of our people. We hope and pray that very soon, no nation will lift a sword to another. Lo goy el goy cherev. No, no nation will continue to be at war. The day that the nations will dwell together in peace, and there will be peace not only in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, but throughout the entire world. Amen.